Havatski Üniversitesi'nden e, Profesör Jeffrey Perret bize Rules and Variations in Distributed Morphology e, isimli konuşmasını yapacak. E, Perret'la iki sene önce e, bu yaz okulu var, ek bilir misiniz bilmiyorum, orada tanışmıştık. Kendisinden rica ettim. E, bizi kırmadı geldi, sağ olsun. E, şimdi alkışlarınızla sahneye ona bırakıyorum.
terminology, uh, and that is something like the narrow faculty of language, not thinking of language in the broad sense, but in the narrow sense, um, is a computationally perfect, quote unquote, uh, mapping between interfaces. So language has to map uh, language external motor and perceptual systems and language external systems of thought. So, uh, um, <clears throat> cognitive, intentional systems, and uh, the minimalist program says that's all there is to language, uh, and that this computation uh, is uh, maximally economical. Um, <clears throat> one of the, I think, uh, major achievements of uh, minimalist thinking in generative grammar has been uh, the discovery that phrase structure, uh, structure building, hierarchical syntax, uh, can be reduced to a single operation, uh, namely merge. So merge takes two syntactic objects uh, and puts them together to form a new object, uh, a phrase uh, with a label. Now these objects that are combined by merge can either be uh, syntactic primitives, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, or they can be uh, phrases that were already uh, constructed by merge. So that makes merge recursive because uh, its output is its input. Um, <clears throat> the label of the phrase that's uh, constructed by merge uh, will be determined by uh, a minimal search algorithm. That's what you read about in problems of projection. <clears throat> um, syntactic structures uh, built by merge uh, are then spelled out to the interface. Uh, for interpretation at LF, logical form, and uh, externalization at PF. Uh, it's evidently not the case that the computation to PF is perfectly economical. All kinds of uh, uh, new things are introduced, uh, and there's this uh, interface with the physical external world, so the strong minimalist thesis is false for PF, and in this way of thinking, uh, the job of syntax is to create LF. And uh, things get uh, strange when you have to externalize this mind internal hierarchical object into something that's going to be a physical signal. So externalization then uh, can be uh, the major source, if not the only source, of uh, variation. So what about distributed morphology? Distributed morphology began to emerge um, at about the same time as the minimalist program in the early 90s. Uh, the foundational document here is Halley and Morantz, 1993. Um, but the theory of distributed morphology has developed a lot since then. Uh, I'm going to be mainly thinking of uh, distributed morphology in the terms of Embik and Neuer, 2007, in their handbook article. Uh, and when I talk about roots, I'm really going to focus on Harley, uh, Heidi Harley's uh, paper from, well, 2014 uh, about roots, uh, and also Andrew Nevin's uh, post-syntactic morphology lecture notes uh, from 2015. Um, so, and, and by the way, I'm not going to claim that these ideas are unique to distributed morphology or that distributed morphology was the first uh, to come up with these ideas, um, but certainly distributed morphology can be characterized by uh, something like the following. Uh, first of all, the reason it's called distributed morphology is that word formation, uh, what's traditionally thought of as morphology, uh, is distributed in the model. So morphology doesn't take place in any one part of the model, but actually uh, is uh, in several places, and most importantly, word formation is syntactic. So words have syntactic structure, and there's no difference between the uh, syntactic processes that uh, construct phrases and the syntactic processes that just construct words. So uh, morphology is syntax. Uh, second of all, uh, there's no lexicon. There is no lexicon in distributed morphology. Uh, now, this is something that 
some people find counterintuitive, uh, some people find this offensive, the idea that there's no lexicon, um, but there really isn't. Okay. Uh, there's no lexicon in two distinct senses of lexicon, so Ben Mick and Neuer discussed this. Uh, first of all, there's no lexicon in the sense of a, of a separate structure building component. So there's no pre-syntactic module where you build structure. The only structure building in uh, human language is merge. Merge is what creates hierarchical structure. So there's no pre-syntactic lexicon. There's no lexicon. I'm going to say that a lot. <coughs> uh, secondly, there's no lexicon uh, in another sense. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard, I think it's DeShulo and Williams, the prison for the unruly. Uh, there's no lexicon in the sense of a single place in, in the grammar um, where phonological features, semantic features, and grammatical features all live together. Uh, so there's no lexicon <laughs> in, any, uh, in any of the traditional senses of lexicon. Um, this actually has a big implications. Um, <clears throat> And exciting ones, I think. Um, the other aspect of distributed morphology uh, that's important is uh, late insertion. Uh, phonological exponents for terminals is determined post syntactically. So syntax uh, doesn't work with any phonological features. There are no phonological features prior to syntax. Uh, and phonological features are added after a syntactic structure is created. <clears throat> so, what we have um, in this way of thinking um, is a very strict implementation of the classic Y model. <coughs> so here you've got the Y model, I put it on the board too. I might go over there later and draw some things on there, but uh, uh, this is what you've got. So, there are three lists, instead of a lexicon, there are three lists, and I'm going to talk about them each uh, separately. Um, first of all, there's the formative list. So, these are the primitives that enter syntactic computation. Uh, items in the formative list uh, are what is merged together. Uh, the formative list consists of roots. Uh, and bundles of features, in other words, heads. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so these primitives are uh, constructed by merge. Uh, it's standardly thought that agree is also an operation of syntax, uh, but that's it. So syntax builds structure, um, and then we have spell out. So the syntactic structure um, is sent off to the interface. And <laughs> still playing with the Y model. Uh, you send off a syntactic structure to the interfaces, um, and uh, at each interface, you have another list. So on the LF side, you have the encyclopedia list, and this gives the interpretation of roots, the semantic interpretation of roots. Uh, on the PF side, you have this branch between syntax and phonological form, uh, this is what we could call morphology, uh, and here there are some post-syntactic operations that prepare a hierarchical uh, syntactic structure to be a linearized uh, phonological uh, representation. Okay. So, uh, for example, the operation of impoverishment. Uh, could be a post-syntactic operation. Uh, at PF, there's another list, uh, the vocabulary. And the vocabulary are a list of exponents for terminals. So phonological features to be inserted um, at the uh, syntactic terminals. Mm. Okay, now we're ready. All right, so I'm going to go through the why. Actually, can you go back for a second? Just for a second. I'm going to go through the why model. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the formatives. Uh, I'm going to say a little bit about syntax, then I'm going to talk a little bit about morphology, I'm going to talk about uh, vocabulary and late insertion, uh, and then 
when I talk about roots, uh, we'll go over and look at the encyclopedia. All right, so <clears throat> what's in the formative list? So this is the pre-syntactic uh, pieces. Uh, remember, there's no lexicon. So the formatives consist of roots and feature bundles. The roots uh, have no categorical features, no phonological features, no semantic features, no grammatical features. Okay? They are just these pieces. They have a numerical index, which is going to uh, link them up with uh, the lists at PF and L. So it's going to li uh, link up a root with its uh, exponents and with its interpretation in a syntactic structure. Uh, the other thing in the formative list are feature bundles. So these are grammatical features and categorical features. Uh, I'm going to assume that these are supplied by universal grammar uh, and that they're bundled uh, into terminal heads during the acquisition process. Um, note the bundling question. Uh, does syntax operate on feature bundles as standardly assumed? Uh, or does it operate on single features? Uh, so that you merge single features together. Uh, that's what the uh, nano syntax, this new framework, uh, that's what nano syntax says. I'm going to stick with the, the standard feature bundles, um, but I acknowledge this as, a, as an open question. My personal opinion is that this is part of acquisition. Um, so you can see the, the feature bundles or features, uh, they're like little v or little n. So these are categorizing features uh, to make something a verb or a noun. Uh, and then we have, for example, number minus singular or uh, tense plus past or d plus definite. So these are the formatives that will be operated on by syntax. Okay, so in the narrow syntax uh, is where we build the syntactic structure. And again, the idea is that uh, there is no language without syntax. There is no meaning without syntax. Uh, there are no words without syntax. So first we have merge. Uh, as I mentioned, this single operation takes two objects, either formatives or phrases, uh, and combines them into a set a new object with a label, the label determined by a minimal search. So, for example, if you had a root uh, and you had the D uh, determiner and you have a categorizing head noun, first you merge the root and the categorizing head and you get something like this. Then you merge, say, a determiner and you get something like this. And this is hierarchical and recursive. And I just put the T there. That could be root 713 uh, corresponds to T. All right. Um, and then there's agree. So feature matching and evaluation under C command, uh, sort of standard stuff. This is just, for example, uh, tense agreeing in five features with a, a DP that's going to be uh, raised to subject. <coughs> Uh, there's also a question here, uh, the agreement question, is agreement an operation in narrow syntax, as standardly assumed? Uh, there have been various proposals for how that works, including upwards agreement. Uh, there are some people uh, who have suggested that uh, agreement is post-syntactic, uh, Bobolik, uh, myself, in much less well-known work. Uh, I'm going to stick with the standard and uh, assume that it really is syntactic. So there we have narrow syntax. All right. So spell out to PF. Once you've merged together a hierarchical syntactic structure, um, you send it to the interfaces, and at least one thing has to happen, uh, namely linearization. So that's sort of like the minimally necessary post-syntactic operation since a syntactic structure uh, has no linear order. 
Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, many of you are familiar with uh, the, the many, many, many arguments uh, that show syntax uh, is not linear, uh, but hierarchical and structure dependent. Um, but of course, a physical signal by physical necessity must be linearized, so at least one operation applies uh, linearization. Uh, in distributed morphology, there's been some uh, arguments that linearization is simultaneous to vocabulary insertion, so exponents, uh, or perhaps interleaved. Um, I just put here impoverishment. Impoverishment is a hypothetical post-syntactic operation. Um, <clears throat> it's a feature deletion operation. So it takes, uh, it takes features away from fully specified terminals. Uh, and it does this uh, because of uh, markedness. Language-specific morphotactic markedness. Uh, and it's constrained in various ways, including by uh, locality, morphosyntactic locality. Um, <clears throat> this is just an example um, from my work with Andrew Nevins. Uh, this is a impoverishment rule uh, in second person for English. So this rule deletes a uh, number feature, so a number feature becomes zero in the context of the features that define second person. Um, So, the exact nature of post-syntactic operations like this, and the number of post-syntactic operations like this, and the order that they apply is currently under debate. And there are some people who have argued that there should be fewer such operations, um, and try to get rid of some of them, uh, and so on. And that's still an open question. Alright, so then we get to the second list. Um, the list of vocabulary. This is the list of phonological exponents for terminals. Um, the list uh, contains at least two kinds of information. First of all, the substantive features that identify the terminal where the phonological exponent is going to be inserted. Uh, and then, of course, the exponent itself. So I've given here a vocabulary for English tense when it's been uh, combined with uh, the auxiliary copula B, uh, past tense, and some phi features. So this says uh, if, if the terminal is uh, plus singular, you insert the exponent was, and in all other instances you get an elsewhere, you get a default word. Now, vocabulary obeys the subset principle. So, that says that you can insert an exponent um, that is underspecified. So the terminal can have more features than the exponent. As long as the exponent, as long as the vocabulary item, contains a subset of features on the terminal. That's the first part. Uh, <clears throat> it can't be inserted uh, if the vocabulary item has a feature that is not in the terminal. So you can't uh, contradict uh, a feature in the uh, vocabulary insertion. <clears throat> and the maximal subset clause says that uh, you insert the exponent that's most specified. So the one that has the most features will be inserted first, uh, and then the one with fewer features or no features will be inserted uh, uh, as a default. So this is, uh, this is how you get phonological exponents for uh, terminal nodes in syntax uh, at PF. And of course, I have given these for uh, grammatical terminals like, uh, like singular, like number. Um, we're going to see that the same thing applies uh, when we talk about root. Okay, so why have late insertion? Why is there late insertion in this model? It's not only for fun. Um, the answer is allomorphy. That's the reason for late insertion. Okay. Um, 
In other words, phonological exponents depend on syntactic structure. Therefore, you can't have phonological features before syntax. So, I just have a couple simple examples here from English. This would apply to any case of allomorphy. So, plurals in English, irregular plurals. So, nouns take s uh, as a plural. So, this is a spell out, uh, this is a vocabulary, uh, excuse me, this is an exponent of uh, the number feature, minus singular. But uh, some nouns don't take the s. So, if you have kid, which incidentally, they mean about the same thing. Kid, the plural of kid is kids, uh, the plural of child is not childs, as you might expect, but rather children. So, you have a vocabulary, uh, something like this, where uh, you have a highly specified vocabulary item that says, if you are uh, if you are minus singular, insert the exponent n. Uh, in the following context, just in case, the root is on this list. So this list will include child and ox, uh, and for example, breath as in brethren. Um, here are some other irregular vocabulary. And then the elsewhere is the s. Is the, um, same thing here with uh, irregular verbs. So we have uh, this strong, weak, and uh, regular pattern in English, something like verbs like see uh, in the past tense are saw, uh, by in the past tense is bought, so that's that T, uh, and then uh, the regular ones, they get ED. So what you have here is vocabulary like this, where um, if you are uh, looking at t plus past, you're going to insert the exponent 0 uh, if the root is on the list, if it's on the list of uh, special roots. Uh, same thing for the weak ones, t. Just in case the root is on the list, you insert t. And elsewhere, ed. Okay, so give me the next slide. Okay. It's of course possible, technically, to handle allomorphy in a pre-syntactic lexicon. Um, but the question is, why would you want to do that? It recapitulates syntax. So, in the syntax, we're eventually going to merge uh, a root with uh, a noun categorizer. Uh, we're going to uh, take that object and merge it with some number head. Why would we want to recapitulate that? Do it twice in the model. Uh, I think it's even clearer for the verb uh, tense examples, uh, since uh, we have good evidence that T, the tense, is an independent uh, head. Especially in English, there's extremely good evidence for that. So, why do we want to say something twice in the grammatical model? Do it once in the lexicon, and then do it again in syntax. So, since we already need to refer to the syntactic context of a terminal, namely, which root it's merged with, uh, since we already need that, uh, we don't need a lexicon. So there's no lexicon. Uh, allomorphy, I think, is a strong argument uh, for a late insertion. All right. Okay, so where am I? Performatives, the syntax, spell out, morphology, PF, the vocabulary. I saved LF uh, for last because I want to talk about roots. Again, this concept is not unique to distributed morphology, and I don't claim that it's invented by distributed morphology, but it's a crucial part of distributed morphology now, um, and the most famous the uh, paper on roots is Moran's 1997, uh, Don't Do Morphology in Your Lexicon, uh, where he gave very strong arguments against lexicalism um, and for a version of roots. Um, I'm definitely going to be uh, having
in my mind, Harley 2014, um, and if you look at that, it's, in, it's published in a, um, in a special issue of a journal, and it's got a whole bunch of responses uh, by different people. So you can get different views on what roots are, um, and then again, Nevin's uh, 2015, uh, which I think is a really good uh, introductory uh, but sophisticated discussion of all these issues. So, what do you have? Roots are like blanks. They're just pieces of structure. Uh, remember, roots have no features. They just have a number. It's an index, an index, a pointer. So it just tells you where to find the vocabulary items for the root and the encyclopedic interpretations for the root. Uh, roots have no category. Uh, roots have no phonology, roots have no semantics, uh, and they have no grammatical features. Okay. In other words, roots can never be pronounced or interpreted unless they are combined with syntactic terminals in its syntactic structure. Uh, so Nevins has this great, uh, this great analogy, roots are like Schrodinger's cat. Okay, give me the next one. Bam! <laughs> Schrodinger's cat wonders how you like it. Human in the box. Do you know Schrodinger's cat? Schrodinger's cat is a thought experiment from uh, quantum physics. So the idea is that uh, you have a cat in a box and you can't see the cat. And in the box there's some kind of radioactive material. Uh, and it gives, off, uh, it gives off radiation unpredictably. Quantum, right? And then there's a little Geiger cat. This is, this is like really horrible animal abuse. It's like uh, no animal thought experiments, okay? So uh, it, then when, when the radiation is emitted, the Geiger counter detects the radiation and releases some horrible poison and murders the poor cat. It's awful, okay? But the point is, uh, the thought experiment is that because the quantum uh, domain uh, is unpredictable, uh, you don't know uh, whether the cat is alive or dead until you open the box. So the idea was that the cat is in a superposition of states and uh, you know, it's both alive and dead uh, <clears throat> at the same time until you observe it. Of course, once you observe it, it's either alive or dead. It has to be one or the other. Okay. So the idea is that roots are like this. Roots uh, have no meaning, have no pronunciation. Uh, the only way that you can uh, pronounce or interpret a root is to open the box, namely syntax. You have to combine a root with uh, some uh, grammatical, uh, grammatical, item, grammatical heads, uh, merge them together, uh, and then and only then do you know if the root uh, is a noun or a verb and what it means and how to pronounce it. Okay. So, we just talked about PF, and we talked about allomorphy, and so the first question is, well, if roots are really like I'm saying they are, is there such a thing as allomorphy for roots? Is there root suppletion? So, can you have a phonological exponent of a root that depends on its syntactic structural context? And the answer is yes. Yes, there are. There are suppleted roots. Um, we have a classic example in English, uh, the verb go. So the verb go, uh, when it's combined with past tense, uh, is pronounced went. And the expected form of go is, uh, is impossible. Um, actually, Harley gives a, a cross-linguistic survey of uh, suppletive roots um, in dozens and dozens of languages. Um, so this is something which is well attested. Uh, and so again, remember, the idea is you don't know how to pronounce this root until it's, first of all, merged with a categorizing head, and second of all, merged with T. Now, here's an example that I really like. Um, this is an example in derivation rather than inflection. Um, steel, 
So English has this morpheme er, um, which derives nouns from verbs, uh, and it means something like uh, the agent of the verb, the one who does the verb. Again, notice that's a syntactic meaning, right? Isn't it exciting? Uh, <laughs> uh, so you can take um, a verb like um, rob, when you rob somebody, um, both my sisters are lawyers, so I know the precise definitions of rob and burgle and, and so on. So if you rob somebody, you, you take, uh, you steal from them with uh, some kind of personal contact, like uh, you, uh, you threaten them or you hurt them to take something. That's, that's robbing someone. Um, and so to rob uh, can be derived into robber, which means someone who robs. So that's fine, so mug, mugger, and so on. Um, but what happens when you get to steal, instead of expected stealer, you get thief. So what we say about this in undergraduate morphology is that it's blocked, that thief blocks stealer. So what you have here is something like this. You have a root. Let's call it 348. Uh, and if that root is in the environment of uh, a categorizing little v, um, then it will be pronounced steel. I didn't bother with IPA here, sorry. Um, but if it's in the context of this little categorizing uh, little n er, I'm being vague about the structure, but the point is, if it's in this syntactic context, it's pronounced thief. Now notice, there's really no such thing as blocking. You know, we tell the undergraduates this is blocking. There's no real blocking. There couldn't be blocking because there are no words. And there's no lexicon. So there's no items to block each other, and there's no place for blocking to happen. The reason that you can't say stealer uh, is because there's already uh, there's already a vocabulary entry for this syntactic context of the root. So, stealer um, just isn't a possibility. <clears throat> so there's no blocking. Okay, but check this out. Check this out. It's not that stealer is blocked. Stealer isn't impossible. You can get it as long as you change the syntactic context. So English has um, these really great, very productive compounds uh, called incorporation compounds. Um, everybody knows what they are. You guys watch um, Game of Thrones? Yes. <laughs> I thought you did. Uh, I always use these examples in my classes because everybody knows it. I say, you know, what's Jamie Lannister's nickname? The Kingslayer. And everybody knows what it means. Notice the meaning is completely transparent. And it's syntactic. Kingslayer means slay kings. So you take the direct object of a verb and incorporate it so it becomes part of the verb. So when I was talking about this in my classes, um, the students pointed out to me that in video game culture, when you're playing a multiplayer game, like where you have to shoot monsters or something and get points, right? You're playing a multiplayer game and somebody comes up and sneaks up and kills the monster that you were going to kill and takes your points and they're called a kill stealer. You know this? They're called a kill stealer. Isn't that amazing? Not a kill thief. And notice it means to steal kills. Um, there's another one. This one's an idiom. A thunder stealer. I think this came on... Friends, right? Yeah. This is attested. So uh, there's an idiom to steal someone's thunder. It means to like take their take their credit or take their glory from them. You steal their thunder. Um, so I believe it was on Friends. Somebody said, "Oh, you know, he's such a thunder stealer, not thunder thief, not kill thief, kill stealer, thunder stealer." So in this case, the root. Uh, steel uh, is inside of a verb, it's inside of a complex verb. 
So can you go back? So it doesn't match. Uh, it doesn't match this. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, it doesn't match this environment. So it's allowed to be uh, steel. Um, here's an example from baseball. Uh, I don't know. A lot of Americans like baseball. Uh, I was never particularly fond of baseball. Um, there's not a professional baseball team where I grew up. Uh, I played a little baseball, but the funny thing about Americans is everybody knows about baseball, even if they even if they don't care at all. They know the rules. Everybody knows what three strikes is and so on. So I won't explain the rules of baseball, but just to say that if you are batting and you hit the ball and the ball flies up high into the air, um, that's called a pop fly. I think actually this example is from Steven Pinker. This is from the language instinct. So you have a pop fly. You notice fly, the verb, uh, is irregular in the past tense. So you get fly, flew, not fly. A pop fly is a noun. It can be a verb. And if it's a verb, it's the player pop fly, not the player pop flew. So there's really no blocking. You can get these forms as long as you change the syntactic context. OK. All right. OK, so maybe you're willing to entertain the idea that roots have no phonology. So I hope I've made an argument that uh, there's late insertion of exponents for uh, grammatical terminals. Uh, I hope I've made an argument that there is late insertion of exponents for root terminals. Um, but what about meaning? What about LF? This is the one that seems really strange. Like, no, I mean, words mean something, right? A root mean, must mean something. Uh, but it doesn't. Meaning is also syntax. Interpretation of a root in a syntactic context. So this brings us to list number three, the encyclopedia. Um, the encyclopedia is a list of interpretations for roots. I'm going to assume uh, that the grammatical features uh, mean whatever they mean at LF. So grammatical features like plus minus singular have semantics, and when you send them to LF, that's their semantics. So I don't think we need to say anything extra. Um, but the encyclopedia is a list of interpretations for roots, and those interpretations are only in a syntactic context. Uh, in other words, there's something called allosemy, allosemy of roots, analogous to allomorphy. So I'm going to give this example first. This is an example from Harley and Nevin's uh, throw. So let's call it root 795. So throw, in the encyclopedia, there's an entry for throw when it's a noun, and it means a light blanket, a throw. Now, here it is funny. <laughs> if you put throw in the syntactic context with a preposition up, and you probably know that English and Germanic languages have all these phrasal verbs, well, this is what they are. They are a special interpretation for root in a syntactic context. So throw in the context of up means vomit. It means vomit. And notice when I say mean, these are, these are truth conditional. So throw up means vomit. A throw, the noun, means a blanket. Uh, and throw the verb means watch by hand. Uh, <clears throat> Again, the root doesn't mean anything until it's in a syntactic context. And then it can be associated with some uh, encyclopedia entry. Now, I'm being very vague about this. The encyclopedia is uh, definitely in model theoretic terms. So encyclopedia entries will really be like semantic types and they will be uh, you know, um, 
functions and so on. But whatever the semanticists say they have to be, that's what they are. Okay. But uh, here's another example from German. I don't know if you guys know German. Uh, I'm going to ask you about this one. So this is, I like this word um, because there's a cognate in English. Uh, so schwindlich, uh, the adjective schwindlich, uh, it means dizzy. Dizzy or vertigo or something like that. Um, but if you make it a verb to schwindeln, it means to swindle. The English cognate swindle is like, it's like a fraud or a trick or a crime. <clears throat> now, if you nominalize it, it's der Schwindel, it's in masculine gender, uh, and it has, uh, <clears throat> it has the meaning to swindle, uh, it has the meaning swindle, a swindle. Um, it can have the meaning dizziness, but interestingly, if you use the derived noun, so if you say die Schwindeligkeit, and you can see, of course, that it's feminine gender because of kite, uh, then it can only mean dizziness and not swindle. Uh, do, you, uh, do, do German speakers uh, share this intuition? I've asked a few uh, Germans that I know, and they said that's true. Um, <clears throat> these are just examples, again, of how the root doesn't mean anything until it's in a syntactic context. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let's go. I'm just thinking of many examples. Uh, <laughs> okay, so in fact, in fact, there are some roots, or maybe many roots, that don't have any interpretation at all if they're outside of a particular syntactic context. They mean nothing. So, I've just been randomly collecting these examples, like reckless. Reckless means like, ex with extreme disregard, like, uh, it's analogous to careless, but worse, right? And this is a really common word, it's not an obscure word. So there's such a thing as reckless driving, or reckless indifference to life, or something like this. But notice, wreck doesn't mean anything. Wreck is meaningless. Only reckless means something. So wreck has a meaning only in the context of less. Uh, same for feckless or ruthless. Uh, I didn't put these up here, but notice there's also no such thing as wreckful or ruthful. It, it has a meaning in one syntactic context, and that's it. Um, now, these are traditionally called cranberry morphemes in linguistics. Uh, do you guys know what a cranberry is? Yeah, cranberries are these little red sour berries uh, and Americans eat them uh, at Thanksgiving and Christmas holiday uh, in a sauce. You have to add something sweet because they're too sour to eat by themselves. Um, and, you know, these berry compounds, usually uh, both members of the compounds uh, can be independent free morphemes with some meaning. So, strawberry, straw, blueberry, blue, blackberry, black, but there's no cran. There's no cran. <clears throat> uh, but Harley 2014 calls them caboodle items, which I really like. She calls them caboodle items because they don't have to be bound morphemes. Uh, they can be free morphemes and the same thing holds. So, kit and caboodle, this is a, an idiom in English, it means uh, like every little last thing, like down to the last little thing. Kit and caboodle. Uh, maybe kit means something. I mean, a kit is like a collection of items in a, like a first aid kit or something like that. It's not totally clear that's what it means in the idiom, but the big point is caboodle means nothing. It means zero, nothing. It's meaningless outside of this syntactic context. Uh, I gave another example here to give short shrift to something, give short shrift to something. This is actually um, an archaic word. Uh, it used to have a meaning by itself, but it doesn't anymore. It means like to neglect or to not pay enough attention to something. Uh, I gave short shrift to my, I don't know, 
to my manuscript because <laughs> I was teaching too much. Something like that. Shrift doesn't mean anything by itself. So, uh, so the syntactic context of roots uh, can be within the word, but also uh, in a phrase, in a syntactic phrase. <clears throat> okay, so at least since Moran's 97, uh, we've known that the domain for the interpretation of roots um, is syntactically defined. It's not limited to the word, uh, but it is local, uh, syntactically, uh, roughly, little vp, so agentive little vp. Um, so we get a lot of phrasal idioms uh, that are a verb and its direct object. Um, but we don't seem to find any idioms that involve a, a, an agentive subject. There are a few idioms that involve subjects of uh, verbs of movement, like that ship has sailed, uh, but of course these are plausibly uh, unaccusative, so they look like the, the argument of the verb is actually uh, merged low in the v, little VP, and there is no uh, agent of little VP there. Um, so we have idioms like kick the bucket, the most famous English idiom of all time, uh, which means die. Uh, <clears throat> to die. And notice in kick the bucket, what you've got is um, you have two roots which get a special interpretation in each other's context. So kick. Uh, gets a special meaning in the context of bucket, and bucket gets a special meaning in the context of kick. Uh, maybe something close to lose your life. Uh, I think that's a plausible analysis because there's, a new, there's another idiom, a more recent idiom, namely bucket list. Uh, I don't know if you know this, a bucket list is the list of things to do in your life, in other words, before you die. Um, here's another idiom that I like, uh, jump the shark. I don't know if you've heard of this one before. This is uh, what people say about especially television shows um, when they go bad. So the show is good, and then it jumped the shark, meaning it got bad. Uh, <clears throat> and again, you have special interpretations for both of the roots uh, in the verb and in the direct object. Uh, now, you also have these, um, you also have idioms where only one of them gets a special interpretation. So, a lot of idioms in English would take. So, take a shower, uh, take gets a special interpretation in the context of shower, uh, but shower means shower, right? So, shower uh, has the uh, expected meaning. Uh, take a shower means something like shower, right? It means like, I don't know, do a shower or use the shower or something. Uh, same here with take the stairs. Uh, take the stairs means something like climb the stairs, uh, use the stairs, walk on the stairs. Um, uh, check out the next slide. Can you read that? In case of fire, take stairs. He's taking the stairway, right? So here, I mean, the joke, of course, which everybody understands, the joke is that you take the literal meaning of take and not the contextual idiomatic meaning. Right? Literally take the stairs. So this is the end. Uh, so variation and the encyclopedia, this is sort of what I'm building up to with all this. Uh, what's variation? Uh, I want to make a distinction. I think it's really important to distinguish between inter-individual variation or between individual variation, which we all know about. That's cross-linguistic variation, and linguistics have studied this a lot. Uh, but there's also intra-individual variation within uh, within individual within the same person. Uh, and this is usually called sociolinguistic variation because uh, the variants typically have some kind of uh, social uh, meaning attached to them. Okay. In, in previous work, um, I've worked on variation a lot in, uh, in <coughs> the context of distributed morphology, 
Uh, in my previous work, I've argued that the mechanisms of uh, variation, both kinds, in fact, um, but especially sociolinguistic variation, are PF interface mechanisms. So uh, I've argued that uh, variation can arise if there are non-competing vocabulary or if there are variable. With my, my work with Andrew Nevins, we argued that uh, variation can arise from variable application of impoverishment rules. But uh, what I want to talk about is, what about variation in the meaning of words and idioms? I find this really interesting, and I don't really think anybody's talked about it. Um, so go to the webpage now, if you would. I started seeing this, uh, these articles online, especially this one, Harvard Linguist. Oh my god. Harvard Linguist points out the 58 most commonly misused words and phrases. So you know that anybody, anytime anybody tells you, you know, don't say that, then you know people say it. Anytime that there's prescriptivism, there's variation. Because you don't have to tell people not to say things that no one ever said. So the, the Harvard linguist, um, can you close this? Click the X, don't click on the box. Or <laughs> Can you scroll down? Just scroll down to the Stephen Pinker's picture. There, there he, here he is. Okay, there he is. There's Stephen Pinker. Uh, you probably know who he is. And go up a little bit. He recently wrote this book up to the picture. Yeah, there. He re re recently wrote this book, The Sense of Style, which is supposed to be a, a guide to uh, writing and style that is linguistically informed, which is a great idea. It's a super idea. Um, uh, but of course, uh, nobody understands linguistics, so they just take this as another list of bad things that you're not supposed to say and so on. Um, can you go back to the slides? So I just picked three of these. Um, there's a big list of them. I picked three that I like. Um, and uh, so first of all, disinterested disinterested. Um, in the list, um, Pinker and the language authorities say, well, disinterested, uh, it means not invested. So I have no investment in the outcome, right? So um, I'm disinterested in the performance of your company because I own no stock in your company. But many people think that disinterested means not interested. So, I'm disinterested in superheroes, so I didn't see Batman as a superhero. The, the language authorities say, no, it doesn't mean that, but for them it means that. So, how, what's, what kind of variation is happening here? Um, the same thing with enormity. I, I really like this one. Uh, enormity. What does enormity mean? Well, many people, I shouldn't say many people think it. For many people, it means enormousness. But in fact, according to the language authorities, it doesn't mean that. It means great evil. So we would say something like the enormity of his crimes. Right? What's going on here? Well, if you accept uh, what I'm saying about roots, uh, then you can see exactly what's going on here. It's namely... Uh, encyclopedia entries. So, if I don't have a special encyclopedia entry for interested in the context of dis, then I will think, well, interested means interested, dis means no or not, therefore, it's got to mean not interested. And if I listen to the language authorities, of course I can update my encyclopedia. I can add an entry and say, okay, I hear you, uh, it means not invested. So I'm going to add a special entry for interested in the context of dis. Interested in the context of dis means invested. So that disinterested means not invested. Same thing with enormity. So you encounter enormity, you say, well, I think I know what enormous means. And itty means this is a noun, so this must mean Enormous noun, the noun of enormous enormousness. That's what it's got to mean. But you can update your you can update your entry. Uh, you can update your entry so that uh, that uh, 
the root for a norm uh, gets a special uh, encyclopedia entry in the context of itty. And notice also that enormousness can't mean ever great evil. Um, and finally, here's one with, a, with an idiom, and this is like my favorite one of all time. Uh, beg the question. Now, for many people, what beg the question means is raise the question. So, uh, Batman example in Batman Begins, uh, Alfred is talking to Bruce Wayne, uh, and he says, this begs the question of what a billionaire does with all his money. But for others, what beg the question means is circular logic. It means to assume the conclusion. The conclusion of your argument is one of your premises. That's a fallacy. So question begging is a fallacy, a circular logic fallacy. Um, can you go to the next slide? I like this one, a player begging the question. Um, can you go back? So, what's going on here? Well, clearly, this is like uh, the same as we saw with uh, take a shower versus kick the bucket. So, for people who, um, who think that beg the question means raise the question, beg gets a special interpretation in the syntactic context of question. But question means question. It doesn't get a special interpretation. So beg the question for them is like, take a shower. Whereas for people uh, who have this encyclopedia entry, both of the roots get a special interpretation in each other's context. So beg means assume, and question means conclusion. Uh, so that beg the question uh, for these people is something like, uh, kick the bucket. So, here's uh, the football guy again, begging the question, uh, and I have a couple of references for you, uh, and then we go two more, one, two. Thank you very much, uh, I really appreciate it. Personally, I'm at the very beginning of thinking about this. 
Um, it seems to me that there could be uh, certain idioms with, well, maybe we shouldn't call them idioms. I mean, these are truth conditional, right? Kick the bucket means die. So it's true in a, possible, in a world where death occurs, right? Um, <clears throat> well, they're truth conditional uh, as opposed to pragmatics, which is, of course, not truth conditional. It seems to me that it's possible that some uh, expressions might be uh, uh, pragmatic rather than truth conditional idioms. So I was thinking about something like when pigs fly. Do you know this one? I've heard of that one. When pigs fly, it's like um, it will never happen. It will happen when pigs fly, right? Uh, I will be a prescriptivist when pigs fly. I think, well, what, what does that mean? It, maybe it's pragmatic. Maybe the truth conditions of when pigs fly are literally when pigs fly. Like and then it's pragmatic. You say, well, why the hell did he say that about pigs? We all know pigs don't fly. Well, he must be saying that it's impossible. Right? That would be pragmatic as opposed to uh, semantic. But I think, I think there's a lot of work to do. And these cross-linguistic idioms is like a big open area for this. So I think that's really, um, that's really, uh, that's really excellent. Um, <clears throat> What I mean is, what if, uh, like, kicking... Oh, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you, I just wanted to answer the, the other part of your question. Uh, you said the story behind it. I just want to point out that we have to always keep in mind that there's a difference between diachrony and synchrony, right? So, if you're a, if you're a, uh, you know, you speak a language, um, you don't have to know the history of the idiom to know its true condition. I have no idea why I kick the bucket means die. I have no idea. But I don't have to. Uh, English speakers don't, for example, have to know the history of English to know when to use in and when to use un, like illegal and unlawful, right? Now, the diachrony can be interesting, definitely, and it might go toward figuring out the role of pragmatics and so on. I think that would be fascinating, but um, we just shouldn't uh, conflate these things. We can definitely give a, a model of the linguistic knowledge involved in idioms without appealing to their uh, historical development. I think I tried to address your question. Yeah, but as you know, most native speakers, even I, I didn't know the meaning of the idiom that I said, but you know, somebody explained it to me. I, I, what I mean is, what if uh, like kick and bucket don't have any interrelation, but the story that was told just made it so that the meaning was dying. For example, maybe the guy kicked the bucket and they do though. They, water they, they, and they clearly do so. because because you, you can't say kick the pail, for example. Yes, but you can't say. Clearly, I mean, you can say it, but it doesn't have the it doesn't have the meaning die. In fact, that idiom uh, can't be passivized, so <coughs> you can't say the bucket was kicked. Whereas some idioms you can passivize, like drop the ball. Drop the ball means make a mistake. But you can say the ball was dropped. So the syntactic context for the special interpretation of the root, uh, I mean, I just talked about the direct object, but it also has to include, for example, voice heads and things like this. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I uh, yeah. <laughs> I just kind of dropped off there. Um, can I take the next uh, question? Thank you. Uh, okay, so first I'd like to thank you for your energy and your enthusiasm. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I have two relatively general questions. Um, first is about, you talked about how there is no lexicon actually in reality. So I thought to myself, uh, if there is no lexicon and there is no structural units that have individual meanings in every meaning, assigned meaning, then there is only the relationship, an integrated A relationship or A structure, but nothing else, just the relationship. Is that true? Is that possible? I think, I think so. It sounds In reality. I mean. Yeah, I mean, that sounds, I think that's what I mean to say. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah the, 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 the meaning uh, is uh, an encyclopedia entry uh, for a root in a structure. So that is the meaning of a root. Uh, so I think if there is no relationship, there is no entity, there is no integrity, nothing else. There 
has to be a relationship first. So the only reality has to be a relationship then, because if that doesn't exist, nothing exists. Yeah. Well, I, I definitely think that. I think that, that, that uh, human <coughs> propositional thought is linguistic. <coughs> and meaning is linguistic, and it's syntactic. Um, I think that that conclusion is kind of overwhelming after a while, and, and exciting, and really amazing. Um, <clears throat> but it's very counterintuitive. Like, everybody knows that words mean something. So, uh, it's very weird to think about there being no meaning uh, except for these, these structures. Uh, but I think that's true. Uh, so, my second question is about, um, I thought about, you talked about how um, syntax is actually a framework for hierarchical, uh, constituting hierarchically structured objects. You talked about objects, abstract objects. Yeah. Um, and I thought to myself, uh, like, we have a logical form and we have a phonetic form. But phonetic form has been bothering me for a long time because, for example, I can just arrange concrete objects in a room so that they mean something in a logical form. And that doesn't have to be phonetic in any sense. So that can still convey the meaning. So, uh, yeah, they, 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 they don't have any connection. You're confused. I mean, LF and PF are not connected. No, no, not connected. But if I say, for example, if I do that, if I arrange the objects and convey the meaning, then phonetic form is uh, wrong in its name. Like, we have to say, like, concrete realization. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, I should have said what I always say, which is that we shouldn't say, we should say perceptual form, because we should never forget that language is not modality dependent, and sign languages are natural languages. They have hierarchical syntactic structure. They should have this exact root stuff, all that stuff. So the, the, the phonological form is really perceptual form, and it's not uh, dependent on modality, uh, definitely. Thank you very much. Do you always need these functional hats to have these roots realized by phonetic form? Or by form? Because I think so. <coughs> okay, like for, assume that we have a root like preposition. So you need something like little p? Uh, yeah, prepositions are really interesting. Uh, I, I've never worked on them, so I, I don't know. But yeah, the prepositions are weird because sometimes they seem grammatical and sometimes they seem lexical, right? Like, it seems to me that I have an intuitive feeling that there's a big difference between a preposition like of or at or on and a preposition like underneath or between or something like that. Um, so you could treat them as roots um, with a categorizing head. Um, you could develop a theory of sort of UG <coughs> grammatical features that get bundled in uh, prepositions. I definitely have in mind that the, when I said feature bundle, I didn't really talk about that, but feature bundles like, um, for example, gender. So gender uh, being features on little n, right? So during acquisition, you figure out which are the features and you have various little n's, like for example, you might have little n female, little n, you know, male, something like that. Then you merge those with roots. Um, <clears throat> so I really do think that um, you have to have functional structure um, <clears throat> in order to have syntax. You have to always have functional structure. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there's, again, there's a lot of work to be done to figure out exactly uh, what's going on there. And if you believe in nano syntax, then you don't believe in bundles at all, right? There's just I don't believe in nano syntax. Well, I mean, if one if one believes in such things, you think, okay, there are no bundles. There are just features, and the features are combined. Nano syntax. So uh, I don't want to take too strong a stand on this, but um, my personal intuition is that the, uh, the bundling of features and functional heads happens during acquisition. So the agreement uh, occur in the, you're just taking the roots, right? No, no, no. Well, it couldn't because roots have no features. So roots can never agree. 
only thing that agrees is uh, is functional functional features and okay, like the functional hat, like little hand or little we. So they kind of well, them. like um, like for example, T tense and uh, determiner. Okay. So that I guess um, so, okay. again, it, this is like a whole can of worms, right? Talking about agreement. Like if you think that. If you think that there are uninterpretable features, therefore they have to be uh, valued or checked or something before they go to the interface. Uh, so they have to be in some syntactic configuration with an interpretable version of the feature, something like that. So you have an uninterpretable feature on T, and you have some interpretable feature on D. So it will be like a number feature, a person feature. Uh, they're uninterpretable on T. Uh, they're Semantically uninterpretable, interpretable on D, so that uh, when you merge T, uh, it immediately probes into the C command domain and finds a matching feature to value it or check it. And it's a standard story. Uh, I have a million so questions, but I don't want to troll the other audience. So. Yeah. yeah, please. Thank you. not about the roots, but uh, about the other thing which confuses me. So, for example, uh, we saw the uh, idioms, but take a shower, take a shower. Um, the thing which confuses me is a grammatical root or a lexical root. For example, take a shower, take a shower. It has no sense. But you know that taking a shower means like going to bath and doing other things. And, but, for example, when we write, when we type, do a shower or make a shower, it's incorrect. So, it's, yeah. not, it's a grammatical mistake. Um, but the thing about the cram verse, so cram is a root, verse is a verb, you know, but we don't know what cram exactly means. Uh, cram the is a, it's, it's a creature of one person, uh, so the uh, word cram was created by the person, and maybe we don't know who this person was. So, for example, I, I can say not the lamp, maybe it's just another thing, I can just uh, think about the other word, I can uh, say not the lamp, but um, candle, for example, I can say this is a candle, not the lamp. And uh, the thing which I ask is also, what does uh, it mean, the correct, correct use of the language? So I think the language that shouldn't have, shouldn't have uh, boundaries like we have. So taking a shower, we may, we may say do a shower, make a shower, because the language and the words which we are using, uh, it were created by normal persons, not the professors, not the doctors, but it is normal persons who live before us. So uh, I don't know, so uh, grammatical, Boundaries, grammatical limits, and lexical limits, so it's not correct, it's, it's incorrect, it's correct. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just confused. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I think I understand you, uh, and I, of course, agree. Uh, you probably noticed that I'm sort of mocking the prescriptivist uh, notion, right? Uh, so I think, and I just have so many arguments with non-linguists about this all the time. There's like no such thing as incorrect. Okay, what, what, but what could it mean? What it could mean, like in the case of do a shower, what does that mean? It means there's no encyclopedia entry. Now, if somebody, um, if somebody coins a new word or phrase or something, um, then they have an encyclopedia entry. And then it's just a question of, well, do you guys want to update your encyclopedia or not? And if, you know, if it catches on, then great, and if it doesn't, then it doesn't, right? Uh, but it, the, the point is that in, uh, in linguistics, it's all modeled as something in individual. So a person could, say, do a shower, and they have an encyclopedia entry, and they're fine with that. If no one else does, then they'll be the only one. And is it correct? Well, I mean, for them it is. But for example, TBT, Throwback Thursday. So nobody knew what was the Throwback Thursday. TBT, was. Throwback Thursday. Yes, TBT. But now we all know what is TBT. So first person who uses TBT and said, for example, do you know what, is, what does TBT mean? There was no, no, and nobody knew. But now everyone knows. So for example, do a shower and make a shower be the same. So I uh, and take a shower. Yes, we can create this by ourselves. But you make, it, you make a new 
it's my Wikipedia entry. And if I tell you something you don't already know, what I say to my students is, like, everybody knows what the White House is, right? Unfortunately, everybody knows what that is. What's the White House? It could mean a house that's white, but it also could mean the U.S. presidential mansion. But now I say, what's the Blue House? You don't know. So you know that it could mean a house that's blue. So that's phrasal syntactic, but you don't have any special interpretation in context like you do with white house. But now I'm going to tell you that the blue house is the uh, presidential mansion of the uh, president of the Republic of South Korea. The South Korean president lives in the blue house. Now you know. So now you update your encyclopedia. Now you know that the blue can have a special problem, a special meaning in the context of house. Uh, and that's how it goes. So there, there's no correct. There's just individuals um, with lists. Everybody has the same syntax. Everybody has a different list. Everybody has a different encyclopedia list. Everybody has a different uh, vocabulary. Um, this, is, this is my view. Uh, and I definitely agree that um, there are no boundaries. In fact, that's what's amazing about language is that it's infinitely creative. And it's infinitely creative exactly because of syntax. Because you can always put together a new object, uh, so there's no limit. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should continue this discussion after the lunch. Okay. Is everybody starting? Everybody's starting. We started late. Yeah. Thanks, to, thanks a lot for all your questions and your interest, everybody. Thanks for having me.